You have to feel so proud. That's amazing. Thank you. Mr. West, you did a fantastic job. <laughs> and you talk about kick and tail. Uh, really, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And we're grateful you're here. Um, and want to say thank you to our panel. And what I'd like to be able to do is open it up to the senators and we'll go to the majority leader and then to Senator Hancock. Well, I don't have anything to add. I, I just, I'm so impressed particularly by the heroes and sheroes here today who have survived and not just survived, but thrived. Um, what amazing success stories and there's several books here to be written, I think. Um, but you all showed tremendous um, perseverance to succeed um, and are, are the real primary architects of your success. But all of your stories talk about key life rafts that weren't there a lot of the time. But when they, when they did surface, it it was a catalyst. Um, I, I had a question. Uh, I think it's um, Ms. DeMarco in the NMT uh, program. So you mentioned there were certain therapies that have proven to be very useful uh, in terms of the relation building and the activities necessary to, to create the base or the self-confidence to take advantage maybe of of more traditional therapies, but you also suggested that Medi-Cal doesn't cover those. So my questions are twofold. How, I think you made reference, how are you paying for those now? And have there been any efforts um, to get Medi-Cal to review those coverage decisions? Uh, to answer your, your last question first, no, we haven't gotten that far in it. We've been working on the um, uh, connection to these resources in the last probably nine months, but I've got a number of different contracts with local community providers that do OT services, speech and language services, uh, drumming, yoga, art, expressive arts, you know, the YMCA, we're partnering with the YMCA and around gym memberships and things like that. But, um, and that's why Medi-Cal wouldn't pay for those kinds of things because yeah. they're, you know, they don't pay for animal assisted therapy unless it's in the course of a therapist doing rehab services. So, you know, gardening services might be a rehab program that you could do, but it's not the traditional therapy that Medi-Cal authorizes through you know, our, our youth system. So it, we, and we realized that very early on in our first year of training staff, we're learning how to do these assessments and they're sequential in, in nature in the, in the sense that it really gives you a visual map of where in the brain you need to start, whether it's at brainstem or limbic system in terms of where the disorganization or developmental issues are. And so the, the, the those kinds of interventions are much more activity-based mm -hmm. and are out, outside of the, t the traditional 50-minute hour. Right. And so it's really looking at much more of a building a therapeutic web in the community than a standalone service. Um, it's more of clinicians operating as um, advocates and case managers where they may do a portion of what this child needs, but there's a whole bunch of other people that they're connected to that are doing the other things so that the child can actually benefit better from the therapy. And it's what Christy Brant in Napa County talks about as being the, the tile and grout uh, model, yeah, I you like know? That. And, and that's really what we're trying to create. Yeah. So as you, I'm sure, have experienced our bureaucracies are locked in both antiquated systems and mm -hmm. resistant systems. We've seen in our prison systems, mm -hmm. uh, art programs, yoga, um, drumming, things, they get mocked by certain yes. members of society, yes. even certain members of our legislature is a misuse of taxpayer money. Right. And I think your testimony and the, the positive experiences, we need to just amplify yes the success stories, and from you know, a, a cost-benefit analysis, yes. um, the investment in swimming lessons, if it proves to be 
a catalyst for somebody gain, regaining their health yes. in the long run is going to be a much <coughs> less expensive investment yes. than years of protracted, complex um, yes. drug therapies, et cetera, exactly. et cetera. Exactly. We're not doing cloud therapy. I've had, I've had uh, people tell me that. Um, and what we have now that we didn't have even a few years ago is the neuroscience that shows us why it works. Mm -hmm. And the research, like from Dr. Perry and many others, that gives us the data that we need. One of the slides that I, I sent up ahead of time for your, your background information is a slide that Dr. Perry uses a lot that shows that in residential programs, and we've seen this in our own level 14 where we've implemented this with our whole staff, we've thrown out the point and level system completely. And what you see in a very short period of time is a drop in seclusion and restraint in psychotropic medication and an increase in staff uh, satisfaction. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's a hand in hand thing because, uh, and what we see is that when new kids come in, they get an NMT assessment. We have a whole array of somatosensory activities in the program and it takes about a month for them to settle in. And after that, the episodes pretty much go away and kids are getting better at a much faster rate. Well, and again, so we're hoping to have the data that you're talking about. Soon. Thank you. And again, if we can help to put a spotlight on it, that's mm -hmm. that's our job. But you're the you're the real messengers here today. So thank you, uh, thank you. to all of you on the panel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you so much. Senator. Pretty grateful for uh, your hard work and really happy that you're here. We're going to go to Senator Hancock. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Senator McGuire. I have a bunch of questions. I know. Please. It's late, but let me try to um, quickly to San Mateo. If Medicare or Medi-Cal doesn't pay for it, do you put up, how do you pay for it in San Mateo County? <coughs> so we passed a Measure A uh, initiative about a year and a half okay. ago, and it's paid for. Is it a youth program? No, it was a, a, funding? a, a community tax, basically. And the Board of Supervisors in our county decided to utilize the majority of this money to try and rebuild a lot of our youth system services from the public schools to our um, more intensive programs uh, that we lost over the budget cuts over the last 10 years. And so along with that, they allotted um, a pot of money for trauma-informed interventions specifically for this NMT program. And so as we do assessments and identify what a child mm -hmm. needs, the clinicians send me the referral for the service that they need, and I'm able to contract and pay for it out of that fund. That's okay. That's very helpful. Yeah. We should think about things like Prop 63 money, which right. is some mental health money yeah. that we can relate to at the state level. And then I also just want to thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. you um, your experiences have to inform what we do because <laughs> you're the people that know. And I just appreciate that so much. I, one of my big takeaways from today is the business about, in the end, it's all about relationships mm -hmm. <laughs> and somebody being a friend as yeah. opposed to whatever. Yeah. Um, and um, so I sort of wanted to go back to something that Ken Barrick said. Um, you talked about scaling up, right? Um, scaling up high quality foster homes, scaling up, um, oh, something else, I forget. Um, oh, relatives, being at finding relative networks and friendship networks. Um, what did you mean by scaling up? And does that mean that we need to reimburse more? For relatives and higher quality foster homes, what does it mean? So, uh, when when you look at the suite of services that everybody's talking about, and, and it's really largely the, the same suite of services, um, different services will be funded most effectively by different components. And if you put an artificial barrier on any one of those services, then it puts pressure on the other system. So, for example, some counties will. Um, allow uh, a provider that's doing wraparound, for example, to bill uh, Medi-Cal for whatever service mm -hmm. that's medically appropriate. Others put very, very strict mm -hmm. limits on that. Mm -hmm. When you put that limit on, then what you do is you force the 
the monies that can buy activities for kids, the monies that are more flexible to be used for those services and you limit the pool. And that's why what I mean that if, if we take uh, the, uh, the appropriate streams and allow them to mm -hmm. scale, then we can create resources that'll do this. When we did realignment, and this is important, um, um, there is a perception across uh, many counties that um, that access to EPSDT is limited. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And that perception persists and is very, very difficult to shake <coughs> loose. And that then puts pressure on the other systems. Um, so if, if we allow access to each of the funding streams that's driven by the needs of the students, Students, excuse me, but that's, that, it shows well, you my bias for how yeah, I think yeah, about yeah. this. Um, because first and foremost, we want to yeah. see success in school. Mm -hmm. And if you allow those to be the drivers and say, here's the suite of services, we're going to mm -hmm. provide <clears throat> access across the whole system, then those funding streams will have to respond. And I believe that there is uh, the uh, ability to allow those funding streams to do that if there's the perception that the state is strongly behind that. Well, we probably need to find ways to do that too. Then I, um, I know that in the field of corrections, the Pew Charitable Trust has actually worked with the state of Washington, which one of our testifiers mentioned earlier, to they do a cost benefit analysis of various interventions. And somebody, one of you, I think, suggested that we should do that. Gardening, yeah. <laughs> Lots of things that we all know in our hearts um, <coughs> use our energy and are, are very uh, restorative. Um, so I, we might want to look at something like that. I don't, there are methods of doing this kind of cost benefit analysis that um, could show that it is very cost effective. May, may I add just one more thing really yeah. quickly? Um, you, you, Senator, you talked about the certain things that might be more effective. If you look at <laughs> predictors for youth that are going mm -hmm. to be successful and particularly staying out of the juvenile justice system, two primary predictors, reading ability mm -hmm. yeah, that's true. and the youth's perception of what they're good at. Mm -hmm. if, if, if a young person says, these are the things I'm good at, these are the things that I have skills at and has that perception that they can be a successful person that is highly predictive of their ability to then be successful in, 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 in areas of learning and, and work. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you so much, Senator Hancock. Anything else, Mr. Leader? Again, I want to say uh, thank you to the two senators for the uh, wonderful questions and comments. Let's give a round of applause to our panel, please and say thank you so much. It's, uh, it's now time for public comment, and we welcome individuals to please come uh, address both the Human Services Committee and the Select Committee on Mental Health. Um, we ask that you just please come uh, take a seat here at the microphone. If you could please state your first and last name. And we do apologize, but uh, we'll be looking at three minutes uh, for each individual comment. Uh, and we welcome any and all of you to please provide testimony. And we'll start to my right and say good evening and thank you so much for being here. Hi, my name is Vanessa Hernandez. I'm with California Youth Connection. I had the pleasure of um, working with these members to share their testimony today. Um, I just wanted to reiterate a theme that um, was coming um, through each of the panels. And it was this theme of self-advocacy <clears throat> or finding someone, an ally to help with that advocacy. Unfortunately, we heard today that when youth were active and um, engaged in their own health plans, that they were being penalized and punished and it was seen as resistance, and it was seen as challenging behavior. So just to provide a comment, um, we need to change this conversation where we value and expect expect that the youth are fully engaged in what's going on in their lives. A 15-year-old being prescribed psychotropic mood altering drugs should understand what it is and why it's being prescribed, and their opinions should be counted for. So on the JV220, um, there's a box that says, did you talk to the youth? And um, 
a lot of that could go into, is it youth friendly? Are you describing um, the side effects in a youth friendly way? And um, that the youth themselves should have a stake in what's going on in their mental, life, mental health, their physical health, and their emotional health. And it should be an expectation, not an obstacle. Thank you. Hernandez, thank you so much. Great that you appreciate you being here, please. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Chair McGuire, uh, Chair Bell, members of the committee staff for convening this hearing and the many stakeholders that are here today. Um, I'm Christopher Castrillo here on behalf of the California Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Uh, we just want to add our voice to the many that are here today that voice concern over the misuse and inappropriate use of psychotropic medication uh, in the foster care system. Uh, we also want to add to the hope that we can uh, work towards crafting some real effective solutions to um, influence some change here this year um, as you work towards as you work through session. I um, want to highlight something that a few different folks mentioned here today and particularly the lack of continuity of care that foster youth receive as they move through the system, um, particularly as they move through different placements um, and how that relates and essentially translates into polypharmacy, um, the inability for um, social workers, case managers to uh, effectively understand and know a foster use prior medication history, their medical history, um, and how all that relates to um, crafting proper diagnoses and treatment plans um, for all foster youth. And uh, thank you. No, thank you so much, Mr. Castrillo. We, we're grateful that you would take the time uh, and be here all throughout the hearing. So thank you so much. Thank you. Start with the gentleman here. If you could please sit your first and last, and we welcome you, sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is James Sweeney. Um, I am a member of COMEO, the Council on Mentally Ill Offenders. Uh, I am uh, an appointee of the governor. And part of our duties include adult and youth um, in terms of mental health. And um, I would like to talk about collaborating so that uh, perhaps the information that you have, the Comeo body, may be able to get. Uh, we think what you're doing <laughs> here is extraordinarily important. Um, I, I do have to give a shout out to uh, my senator, uh, Ms. Hancock, um, and would like to also say that the legislation that is being authored by uh, uh, Holly Mitchell and Jim uh, bill is um, very, very important. Um, we thank you for not only what you're doing, but we thank you for your uh, follow-up. And uh, uh, Chairman McGuire, your co-brother, you uh, are able to uh, make it live. Um, we respect you, uh, and we're glad that you guys are involved in uh, in making this happen. And since it was uh, three minutes uh, and you put your red light on, hey, there we uh, go. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, we're not over and we're not out, but we're done for now. Hey, hey. <laughs> Sweeney, I just greatly appreciate your hard work, sir, and uh, your dedication to this important issue. And it's really great to have you here. And thank you so much for your testimony today. It's good to see you. Good evening and welcome. If you can just please state your first and last name. Okay, my name is Shadé Daniels. Um, I'm a member of California Youth yes. Connection, one of Lonnie Han a Senator Lonnie Hancock's um, interns, like one of my first jobs. By the way, she was, uh, she was glowing about you earlier <laughs> and saying, where the heck is she? <laughs> you see, there we go. Am I right, Senator? Um, I'm currently a service provi provider for a transitional housing program in Alameda County, and I do a lot of consultancy work with um, Youth Law Center and with Missy, which works with commercially sexually exploited children, and I'm a member of CYC as well. Um, one of the, my earliest rem uh, memories was actually being told that medication would assist in taking the edge off of um, how I felt about being in foster care and about the trauma that I'd already experienced. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case, and I had a myriad of behavioral issues that came with the medication. In that time, I dropped out of school. I um, fought a lot more. I went through a lot, um, many more perils than what I had, actually, before I even entered foster care. Um, it really stripped pieces of me. However, um, 
even in that time now, looking at it, I, with all of the hands and feet that's currently in the room, I probably have taken more peels than the number of fingers and toes here. However, I can recall during that two-year period only having hugs that would cover one of my hands. Um, so the, our affection towards our children is most certainly an important part of it. I think one of the things that bothers me most now is that as an adult and a service provider, I'm still coming in contact with youth who are over-medicated. And as an advocate, as well as a service provider, I don't know who to go to to help and assist them with some of these issues. Um, I think a lot of what we spoke about is, um, you know, policy changes and organizational restructuring that we're trying to do, and it's important. Placement changes is important. However, I'm most interested in what exactly can be done now. If we know that our, the group homes um, are where our youth are mostly over-medicated, what changes or what reforms can we place sooner than later that would impact the education amongst group home staff, amongst group home providers, and what medications work, which don't. How can we uh, decrease our numbers? Um, and also for advocates like myself, when I come across you too, it may be not, maybe, because uh, I'm not a doctor, maybe it isn't the case, but who it seems like medication is being abused, how can I say something about it? How can I advocate for this young person? So, um, yeah, I'm very much interested in this issue, but I truly hope that we can focus not only our efforts on what's to come later on, possibly even years, but also what can be done sooner than later, because as we continue this gap, um, these cracks in the system, they'll be more detrimental to our youth than helpful. Thank you so much. And we're really grateful that you're here. Ms. Hancock, do you have? Hey, there we go. Hey, but thank you and great job today. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh. Uh, we'd like to be able to welcome you. If you could please give us your first and last name. And we also welcome anyone else that would like to be able to provide testimony today to please come forward. Hi, my name is Katherine Hickenbotham and I'm just a taxpayer. This subject is kind of new to me. So everyone here, I was very much um, pleased to be educated by all the experts in the field. It was time well spent, but I do have two um, boys near and dear to my heart that are in foster care right now in a group home. And I was surprised, first of all, to see the mixing, mixing of foster youth with probation youth. I would think that the needs would be very much different between even though they might display the similar behaviors, to have them cohabitating in the same home. I think that it, you're just um, breeding um, different behaviors from, from different youth. Secondly, I would like to say that by medicating um, one of them, one of them is 14 years old, just turned it, on Abilify, such a high psychotropic drug. I was, I was shocked that they didn't try any different method, methods. And if we don't teach these children to have self-soothing behaviors, then they we're just turning them into self-medicating adults. And so I'm totally against psych psychotropic drugs. And why would you take a child to a psychiatrist's office and not to the gym? You know what I mean? Why would you offer them a Abilify instead of a multivitamin? So that's what I have to say. That's my opinion. No, thank you. We're really happy that you, you came today and want to keep in touch. So please don't leave without us getting your information and we'll let you know when the next hearing is as well. Thank you, Mr. McGuire. No, thank you. It's great to see you. Who else would like to be able to uh, address the committees? We welcome you to please come forward. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be closing uh, the public portion and just turn it over to Senator Hancock or Senator Monty if you would like to have any uh, closing comments. Just to thank you again, Mr. Chair and yeah. your staff and all of you for not only being here today, but for your patience through the afternoon and the early evening. Uh, you've given us a lot to think about and perhaps more importantly, a lot to work with. Thank you. Couldn't have said it better myself. I hope we can work with the committee staff yes. to think what some of the follow-up things, specific things we could do, either things that require policy change or that we could suggest to the budget committees that are going to be working in this area. Because uh, it, I do agree with the speaker who said we, we do pretty much know what we have to do. And the question is, how do we pick it up and carry it somewhere from, from this hearing? And I know you said there was going to be another hearing. And thank you very much, Senator McGuire, for your leadership on no, this, absolutely. really. No, thank you so much, Senator. Uh, two of you have been doing this a lot longer, and I'm just I'm very grateful. 
Um, and thank you to the senators for taking so much time out of their busy schedule. Uh, I just want to say uh, thank you to all of you for being here today. Special thanks to Sarah and Mariva and Kelly uh, for helping uh, get today's hearing organized. Absolutely give them a round of applause. Thank you. Um, I did not introduce uh, Republican consultant Joe. Thank you so much for being here today. It's good to see you, sir. Uh, and I always want to say thank you to our sergeants, uh, both uh, Mr. Barrett and Ms. Bedford uh, as well for being here today. Thank you so much. And to our panelists, um, just would like to be able to end it with this. Um, there have been, there's been a lot of discussion about numbers today, but I think that we need to focus on the individual foster child. Um, and what the numbers tell us is that we are not doing our job uh, and uh, we must do better. And we can't wait for another decade, uh, which is why I know the senators that are here today, along with this amazing staff team and all of you are committed to move this issue forward. We heard about early and aftercare, uh, access to data, ensuring that social services is providing that in a timely manner, access to mental and behavioral health, uh, rather than just the pill, uh, ensuring that foster youth have the ability to access activities, coordination between mental health and child health care. Uh, could, uh, the continuity of care is absolutely important. Curbing increases uh, incentives, excuse me, for medical professionals in ensuring that we have a strategy in, the, in this gap period between the time that continuum of care is implemented and group homes where we see the vast majority of the psychotropic medication being prescribed. Uh, and our commitment is this, uh, we are gonna stay on this issue uh, and we are gonna need your help. Um, and I think that you're gonna see uh, a series of uh, pieces of legislation that will be advancing this year and next on this important issue. And we're gonna need your advocacy and partnership to ensure that they're gonna be passed. Because the bottom line is it's also going to take additional funding. And we have to be committed to that. We're either going to spend those dollars upstream or spend additional dollars when it's almost too late. And I think that we know that we need to focus upstream. Again, ladies and gentlemen, we're grateful. We're going to be following up. We will provide the information to all of the senators from uh, the amazing human services team we're grateful for your time and uh, we hope that you have safe travels home and please keep in touch as we set our next hearing date. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.